So good morning, everyone. I appreciate the discipline of our crowd this morning that you guys are all ready, quiet, ready to go, uh, promptly at 9. Uh, we'll take the opportunity while the rest of the panel is getting mic'd up to invite folks who are still grabbing their coffee in the other room to do so and come on in. And then we'll get going. I hope everybody is enjoying the new venue here at the museum. It's uh, quite a uh, privilege for us. And as I said yesterday, it's a responsibility for the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation as we put on Capitol Hill Ocean Week to make sure that there is a world-class experience for the speakers, for the sponsors, and for the audience alike. So um, I hope that you all are enjoying the space here. So it gives me uh, great pleasure to introduce this morning's opening panel. Before I do so, I want to remind everybody of a couple of housekeeping uh, items in addition to the coffee and lunch that will be in the next room. Beyond that, we have the exhibits, and I encourage you to go there uh, during the breaks. And then beyond that, we've got a dedicated networking space for you all to take any conversations, any business that you'd like to conduct over there. It's a wonderful space. And then, of course, across the way, we have the Oceans Live production team that will once again be broadcasting mess, um, uh, a session at noon during lunch that will be shown here. And so I encourage you to grab your lunch. If you want to go out on the terrace, come back here and, um, and get some more on ocean issues. So it's with great pleasure that I get to introduce Michael Conathan, who is no stranger to the ocean community. He's been working on these issues for many years. Uh, Michael will lead the next panel. He's a director of ocean policy at the Center for American Progress, and he is in that role after five years on Capitol Hill in the Senate Commerce Committee and specifically the Senate Subcommittee on Oceans, Atmosphere, Fisheries, and Coast Guard. And while he was there, he worked under three senators, Senators Snow, Stevens, and Hutchison. And during that time, he pushed through some of the most important legislation for the oceans that we have, including Magnus and Stevens' reauthorization, the Integrated Ocean and Coastal Observing Act, the Forum Act on Ocean Acidification, and the Shark Conservation Act. And so it's a real pleasure and privilege to have Mike here to lead this discussion. Great. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Jason. Um, thanks, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, morning's first conversation on um, the next generation of fishing. Um, I actually, uh, I, I told my wife that I was going to be moderating a panel called The Next Generation of Fishing, and, and she said, um, you mean there's going to be a next generation of fishing? <laughs> um, she, uh, I, I guess um, she spent a little too much time with me, and, and, uh, and, and we spent a little too much time in New England. But the other thing you should understand is that actually English is, is my wife's second language. So um, her first language is actually sarcasm, which, um, <laughs> and I know I'm not going to get in trouble for saying that because she's actually watching on the webcast this morning. So hi, <laughs> love you. Um, but uh, more importantly, I, mean, I, I think her response to, to the, the sort of title of the panel is actually, um, is actually pretty telling um, because we are at a real crossroads now with, um, with fishery management, both in this country and, and I think around the world. Um, and there are some really great success stories that we, that we can talk about here. Uh, and then there are a lot of issues that, that we still have to deal with. Um, and, and really, I, I, I think it's a great frame to kind of put on this conversation is to talk about what is the next generation of fishing um, actually going to look like. Um, you know, we, we, uh, we, we actually have a fisherman on the panel here uh, who, uh, with us today, uh, Bubba, who uh, actually is is hoping that his son will will follow in his footsteps and go into uh, into his fishery, which is a, an amazing vote of confidence in in the management structure that, that we have in place, and and uh, hopefully we'll hear a little bit more about that from him. Um, so uh, I want to get to that quickly uh, quickly to our panel because we've got uh, an awful lot of ground to cover uh, today. Um, so with us we have uh, Aaron Adams to my left, who's the director of operations for the Bonefish and Tarpon Trust in uh, in Florida. Um, Bubba Cochran, uh, president of the Gulf of Mexico Reef Fish Shareholders Alliance. Um, Brad Pettinger is the executive director of the Oregon Trawl Commission. Uh, Megan Jeans, the director of fisheries and aquaculture programs at the New England Aquarium. This is, I thought there would be a little more curve so I could actually see you guys. This is a little tricky. <laughs> and then at the end, uh, Matt Tinning, who is the executive director of the Marine Fish Conservation Network. So um, let me give you guys a, a quick overview of sort of how we're going to how we're going to um, try to wrestle this conversation today because we've got so much that we can cover. Um, I, I'm going to 
Um, first of all, I, I want to point out that I, I, I asked uh, our participants to make this a PowerPoint-free uh, operation this morning, so you're welcome. Um, <laughs> so we're going to go total uh, free flow ideas conversation. Uh, I hope there'll be a lot of participation from uh, with audience questions, uh, and and uh, and and we'll be able to hear the topics that you want to get to. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is give each of our panelists a couple of minutes to just introduce themselves, their, their role, their organization. And I've asked them to give me um, two things in addition. The first being what they see as the single biggest problem that's facing uh, fisheries and, and fishery management today. Uh, and then, not necessarily related, but what they see as sort of the most immediately implementable uh, functional solution that we can be using to uh, attempt to resolve some of the problems. So not necessarily the solution to the problem that they identify, because I want to make this um, a, a pretty broad uh, conversation. And then we'll jump into a dialogue and just sort of see where we go. We've got um, a, a whole lot of topics to cover, um, uh, everything from traceability, labeling, certification issues, um, council structure, management. Obviously, there's a Magnuson reauthorization process that's, that's um, getting underway. Uh, issues of science, and particularly uh, how you deal with science in, in, a, in a tight budget climate. Um, roles of industry, international issues. I mean, we, we're going to run the gamut here. So um, I'm going to just jump right into it, because we're rapidly running out of time already. I can, I can see the sands through the hourglass. Um, but anyway, why don't we start with, uh, with Aaron, um, and give us uh, just your intro, and, and, and uh, let us know sure. your thoughts. Uh, my name is Aaron Adams. I am the Director of Operations for Bonefish and Tarpon Trust. Uh, Bonefish Tarpon Trust is a uh, nonprofit, science-based fisheries conservation organization. Uh, essentially, we uh, assess the uh, level or status of knowledge of the species that, that we're concerned with, which is primarily bonefish, tarpon, and permit, which <coughs> are economically important recreational species. Uh, we also assess the threats, conservation threats, and then we fund the science to uh, get a better understanding and then apply that science uh, to conservation and, and management regulation. So it's pretty much from start to finish. Um, from the science side all the way to the conservation application side. Uh, my own background, uh, I am a have a conservation biology background, um, and so that's very much our approach, uh, but I'm also a, an avid recreational fisherman. Um, and part of what we do is work with <coughs> fishermen and guides uh, in the fishing industry uh, to involve them in uh, data acquisition uh, and conservation application. Um, so that it's not uh, what you might call a traditional interaction between fishermen and, uh, and management, <coughs> um, which is often a one-way street of information, going from the fishermen to management, not a whole lot back. So we put a lot of effort into um, turning that around, uh, education involving them in uh, data acquisition, those types of things. Uh, we work throughout the, uh, the Caribbean Basin, um, bonefish tarpon and permit, uh, obviously throughout that area. And they're extremely important, not only in the United States, but throughout the Caribbean. Uh, and because of migrations and uh, larval um, drift, those kinds of things, uh, we are talking about one big regional population of, of these species. So the international angle is also uh, very important to us, as well as interstate. Um, as far as uh, things that are, I think are the biggest challenge, I'd pick two. Uh, one is habitat. Um, habitat loss and degradation, um, if you take, push, put aside overfishing, are worldwide and in the United States for sure the biggest threats, I think, to our fisheries, especially our coastal fisheries. Uh, the other problem that we have with habitat is uh, we don't know what's there. The Gulf of Mexico, for, the, for example, um, how can we manage a species, you pick your species, if we don't know how much habitat is available for them? And given that habitat is, is in, in large part going to limit how big your population of your species of interest is, knowing that habitat availability is, is critical, especially as we move towards ecosystem management. And then somewhat related to that is uh, data acquisition. We need new creative ways to access data, uh, to get data about these fisheries. This is especially true as recreational fisheries become more and more important economically and socially in the United States and elsewhere. Um, our current methods of data collection are not adequate. Um, and this is not a knock on, on any agency. It's, it's, it's extremely tough. Things are changing faster than our, our management paradigm is, and I think uh, most <coughs> of us realize that need. Uh, but we need to very quickly um, change that, how we get data. Great. Thanks. Uh, my name is Bubba Cochran, and like Mike said, I am a commercial fisherman, a real commercial fisherman. I, uh, 
live in Galveston, Texas, and I own and operate my commercial fishing boat out of there for Red Snapper. I also uh, own and operate a federally permitted charter boat um, out of Galveston. I am the president of the Gulf of Mexico Reef Fish Shareholders Alliance, which is an organization of fishermen that are uh, advocating catch shares as right now the best management tool in the Gulf to manage the, the reef fish commercially. Uh, catch shares is not a one-fits-all management, we understand that, but for us in the Gulf it, it works very well and we would like to see that preserved as stakeholders in the fishery and it, that to continue. Uh, we work with the council to come up with solutions in, in management right now. We would like to see the rest of the reef fish complex in the Gulf come under a catch share management. Um, it, it's been the best thing so far to uh, come out of National Marine Fisheries as far as a, a working uh, management system that really helps out the commercial fishermen. Um, the biggest challenges I think for the next generation of, of fishermen as to me has to be accountability. Um, and, and the solution to that has to be using the technology that we have now to be more accountable. We're, we're doing it right now in the commercial fishery uh, under catch shares with VMS. Uh, we're also using, uh, we're, we're looking into electronic log books to get better accountability and what we're catching the more timely data um, to, to the management for what we're catching. Um, the recreational sector right now has very little accountability, but I think that they can achieve that using uh, the, the technology available. Uh, the charter for hire sector um, who take recreational people fishing have that, I, I think they are the most likely candidate to be able to use this technology to make that part of the recreational uh, fishermen more accountable and get an idea of what they're catching. Um, and not, not only what they're catching, but what they're, what they're throwing back to. And, and accountability doesn't go just as far as, you know, well, well what are the fishermen catching? What are they throwing back? What is, what is surviving? And, and, and it goes also to habitat. Where are they fishing? And, and how are they interacting with that habitat? Um, I think that the, the next generation, the more accountable they can get, the more sustainable the, the fishery is going to be. Great. Thanks, Bill. Brad. Uh, yes, my name is Brad Pettinger. I'm the uh, director of the Oregon uh, Trawl Commission. We're a state commodity commission that represents the uh, trawlers on the Oregon coast. It uh, covers three sectors, the uh, Oregon pink shrimp fishery, the uh, whiting fishery, and also the ground fish, uh, the ground fish trawl fishery, which catches the soles and the, and the rockfish and uh, black cod. Um, in that, uh, uh, what the commission does is we uh, basically we do generic promotion, we do, uh, we do research, education, and we uh, comment uh, and monitor uh, on proposed legislation and regulations. Uh, on generic promotion, we are the uh, one of the big things we do nowadays is we're the uh, we're the client for the uh, three um, um, for the certification of three fisheries: the Oregon pink shrimp fishery, the, the first certified shrimp fishery in the world under that program, we're the <coughs> Oregon portion of the whiting fishery, and also we're in the process of the final stages of certifying uh, over 12 species of the roundfish uh, trawl fishery. Um, on the, uh, uh, the the commenting and uh, on legislation and regulations coming up, we also participate in the, uh, the Pacific Council uh, process. I was involved in the uh, Trawl Individual Quota Pro, uh, Committee uh, for eight, eight, like five, six, seven, eight years, something like that. I started in 2004, I finished up in uh, 2010. Uh, we're in the process of the third year of our catch year program. Um, for the most part, people like the program, I like the accountability. Uh, discards are below 5%, which I think if people follow fisheries, that is uh, outstanding. Uh, we'd like to get that lower. Um, uh, uh, but we're, uh, we're pretty proud of that, um, uh, that, how that program, how it's going. Um, I think dealing with the, um, the biggest problem, I think, is the Magnuson Act requires a lot of information. And I think that uh, with the budget cuts coming up, uh, or a lot the, 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 well, the budget issues we have, I think that it's um, not having the money available to do the uh, research and the, uh, that is needed to, uh, to keep these time series going is probably what scares me the most because um, this, uh, the system we have, in the absence of science, things start going wacky quick because obviously if you don't know, you start cutting under the Magnuson Act right now. So I think that is, um, uh, that that's kind of scares me. This year specifically, we, uh, our biggest input to the, uh, to the uh, stock assessments is a, the, um, um, the FRAM survey, the Fishery Research, uh, Research and Monitoring, uh, uh, um, part of the National, uh, Northwest Science Center. Uh, they have four vessels, industry vessels, start from Canadian border, go to the Mexico border, uh, do a fantastic job over uh, over about uh, uh, 
during, during the summer. Um, this year they're going to have one less boat doing it because of the uh, sequester. Um, for me, that's a bad thing because uh, it's it's a random survey and uh, a random survey. It, uh, things go sideways on you if you don't if you if you're missing uh, if you're missing um, the full full slate of spots. So I think that we need to, that, that funding is, is critical. I think we need to keep that going. Um, also, I think recruitment in the fishery on the fisherman side. I think that's been uh, talked about before, but. Uh, uh, getting young people in this fishery, and I think that uh, we need some stability in the management process so people can see a future in it. I think that's what we haven't seen in the past year. There's a lot of uh, uncertainty as to that, and it basically scares people away, and that's, uh, I think we need some uh, certainty. Great. Okay. Um, by the way, we should, we should all thank Brad and his colleagues for, uh, for dinner last night, which was tremendous. Black hot. Terrific. Uh, Megan. Um, hi, I'm Megan Jeans with the New England Aquarium, and for those of you who are not familiar with uh, the aquarium, we're more than just a big fish tank. We actually have uh, a pretty robust conservation and research department, a lot of which revolves around fisheries. Our research department does a lot of work with um, looking at the lobster fishery in New England, looking at right whale migration patterns and sort of interactions with lobsters. We do work on bycatch reduction. Um, in our conservation department, we have a range of different programs, but perhaps the uh, the sort of the cornerstone program that we have is our sustainable seafood work. Uh, so we, in that work, we actually uh, take a multi-pronged approach. So we work on policy and governance reform. We also do a lot of work with consumer awareness and outreach and working with the culinary community in the region. And we also do, excuse me, work with um, companies, so major <laughs> seafood buyers primarily. So we have a number of different corporate partners with whom we work right now. Um, in a lot of different capacities. So we actually tailor our approach working with seafood companies to help them um, address some of their seafood sustainability concerns, um, uh, gain some more insight into their supply chain, do environmental risk assessments of their entire seafood case. Um, we'll do um, evaluations of different fisheries and farms for uh, different companies with whom we work. We'll develop educational materials for their frontline staff and for our consumers that they work with so that they can sort of start talking a little bit more and doing outreach. Um, so it's really sort of a very multifaceted approach that we take. Um, but in that, I, I guess sort of there are a lot of so many challenges out there. And I think one of the overarching concerns right now um, is this tendency that we have to try to make the supply match our demand for seafood out there as opposed to having the supply or our demand be a reflection of the supply. Um, where most people are familiar, we have about 10 species that are sort of the dominant species in the US that we're all consuming on a regular basis. It's very rare when you go out to a restaurant and you see anything but sort of the top 10 tuna, salmon, shrimp, you name it. Um, but frankly, there are a lot of other fish out there in the sea. Um, you know, I think one of the strategies that increasingly is being adopted and getting more attention is let's try to diversify our palate a little bit more. Let's try to ensure that we're not just trying to squeeze the last fish out of the ocean in order to sort of meet this demand that is not really a reflection of what the supply is that's out there. Um, by doing that, we actually, you know, we're incentivizing bad behavior in terms of illegal fishing, seafood fraud, all of which are challenges that folks are trying to deal with in a lot of different ways right now, legislatively and otherwise, um, technologically. Uh, but you know, it's sort of just to get back to the baseline of well, where, where is the incentive to do that coming from? A lot of it's because we have this uh, unreasonable demand for a supply that is not necessarily out there. So, Thanks, Megan. And uh, Matt? Thanks, Mike. Uh, good morning, folks. Uh, Matt Tenning with the Marine Fish Conservation Network. Thanks for joining us in this very timely discussion this morning. Um, for two decades, people in my position responding to the question that Mike posed had a very simple answer, which was chronic overfishing and lack of accountability in US commercial fisheries. Um, we have a long legacy of mismanagement of those fisheries. And I think one of the highlights out of this panel is that that's not my answer, definitively not my answer, because we have done an enormous amount to turn the corner in the United States in the management of US commercial fisheries. And a lot of folks in this room are, uh, have played a role in that. A lot of American fishermen have done a lot of incredibly hard work in reforming the management system. 
Um, and you know, there are certainly still challenges. There are certainly individual fisheries where um, there's a lot of hardship facing individual fishermen and problems with management. But uh, we are definitively on an upward march. Um, and we got more evidence of that uh, last month with the release of the annual status of stocks report to the United States Congress. We learned that another six US fe federal fishery stocks have been rebuilt, uh, bringing the total number of rebuilt stocks to 30 since the year 2000. Um, the Fish Stock Sustainability, Sustainability Index, a composite index, um, which uh, puts objective measures on how US fisheries are going, continues its upward march. Um, and these are just really um, compelling success stories that are often lost in the, uh, the static, the finger pointing, the retribution, uh, which, often, um, which often features in uh, fisheries management and fisheries political discussions. So I think that's a real headline that we, as we consider the next generation of fishing meat, can't lose. Um, and really, I guess my top line would be, when it comes to US commercial fisheries, um, the next generation is already here. Um, and it's here because we've built out a toolbox for success. It is science-based annual catch limits. It is accountability in those fisheries. It is where appropriate rights-based management tailored to the individual fishery. So I think that's a, you know, a really important point that's often lost. Um, and so I guess my answer, given that it's not um, any longer uh, chronic overfishing in US fisheries, although we still have overfishing <coughs> occurring and there's still work to be done, um, is to actually look at the global picture, which is far less encouraging. Um, and we have mm -hmm. uh, real problems in developing world fisheries where nation states aren't using the toolbox that has worked for the United States. And we have high seas fisheries where RFMOs are on a knife edge uh, in terms of their effectiveness, in terms of their institutions. So it's very easy for us, I think, here in the United States to say that's not our problem. <coughs> but the truth is it's a very significant part um, you know, of the global picture and it's something that we actually have a real role in addressing. And so when it comes to Mike's question about solutions, um, I would say there are two things that we in the United States should be focused on in terms of that global picture. One is to make sure that what has worked here in the United States is shared um, internationally. And we should look at ways to export, frankly, the model of success here in the United States around the world. Um, and you know, there, there are some good news stories already to be told there. When Maria Damanaki embarked on uh, CFP reform in the European Union, um, she, she was very explicit about talking about the fact that um, Jane Lubchenco was someone she was talking with about that and looking to, and that the US model was something she was looking to emulate. Um, and similarly, in some of the work that we uh, are seeing nonprofits, NGOs do, foundations do, um, there are ways that they are going about looking at how we can export our model of success. So um, I think that is one part of the solution. The second thing I'd say is that we can't escape culpability for the fact that when global fisheries really are um, in many corners of the world in crisis, 91% of the seafood we consume in the United States is imported into this country. It comes from those fisheries and we have a responsibility there. And um, the solution that I hope we can probe a little bit on this panel, uh, which I'd put forward, is greater traceability of that seafood supply chain. Um, and the, uh, the area where I think we are not succeeding in this country is in terms of knowing um, how that seafood is moving through the supply chain and ensuring that consumers um, and other buyers are getting exactly what they think they're getting. Those of us who want to be sustainably minded in our, purchase have the, our purchases have the opportunity to do that. Um, and there, you know, <coughs> some of the recent studies are more alarming. Um, probably one third of the seafood that's sold here in the United States is improperly labelled. Um, that is a number that would not be tolerated in any other part of the food economy. Um, and we, we know that it's happening and we need to find, uh, be far more urgent in finding solutions to that. There are market-based solutions, which um, maybe Bub Bubba can talk a little bit more about what his organisation's done on market-based traceability. There are, there's also, I think, a need for regulatory or legislative efforts to address this now that we know how uh, endemic the problem is so that we know where the t seafood that we're importing into this country is coming from and so we know that consumers are getting what they pay for.
Thanks, Matt. That was a really, frankly, really good summary and, and brought up a lot of the issues that, that uh, we've been talking about all along here and, and a lot that we're going to talk about um, moving forward. So um, I want to remind everybody first, the, uh, we want your questions uh, as part of this conversation. Uh, there are cards, I think, on most of your seats um, and folks in the aisles to collect them and pass them up to me. So if you have a completed card, just um, put your hand up, signal, and somebody will come over and get it from you and, uh, and bring it up here and we can start to sort through them. Um, I think, you know, there, I have a ton of thoughts now based on what, uh, what came out of those conversations, so I'm trying to sort of sort through where to go next. I think um, the, the issue of, of safety and labeling and, and traceability, uh, which Matt sort of closed with, um, I think is an important one to talk about. Uh, you know, I, I, simply the, the number, 90%, uh, 91% of, of uh, seafood that we consume in this country is imported. That's a huge number and it's a huge percentage. Mm. Um, and it's, we don't even really have a good handle on that because a lot of the seafood that we actually catch in this country that gets exported is then processed overseas and brought back into this country, lab labeled as a product of the exporting country. So, for example, in the Maine lobster fishery, uh, more than two-thirds of the lobster caught in Maine goes to Canada to be processed and comes back into the U.S. with a sticker on it that's a big maple leaf instead of, instead of uh, a Maine lobster symbol. It's a product of Canada at that point. So even that simple equation, we don't, we don't really know. You know, this 90% number is great, and obviously there's a huge seafood trade deficit in this country, but, but even something as simple as that, um, to not be able to put a, a handle on that shows really how far we have to go in that. Um, so I guess I'll start there um, and, and just uh, throw it open to the, to the panel about, um, you know, what are the solutions to get a little more certainty? I mean, the fish that we ate last night, both the, um, <coughs> the, uh, the squid from Rhode Island and the, and the cod from Oregon, you could pop the number into your iPhone app and up comes a picture of, you know, not just where the fish came from, but the, the guy, Chris Brown, right there on my iPhone. He caught my squid. Um, that's pretty cool. Are people going to use that? Uh, is that a tool that, that makes a difference? What are the things that are going to lead to more, um, to more significant traceability in, in cases like this? Um, Megan, you do a lot of work on this. I'm going to throw it to you just to get the conversation. Sure. Uh, I mean, I think there's a lot of different of strategies and approaches that folks are using right now. Um, you know, increasingly there is definitely a, an effort to look at different technological solutions, and um, there isn't a single uh, traceability system in place right now for the U.S., but certainly there are a lot of folks like uh, the, the guys out of Rhode Island, Chris Brown, and others who we also have a guy, Jared Aubach, uh, out of Red's Best in Massachusetts, who have developed their own sort of proprietary traceability systems, some of which are you know, being shared with others within their supply chain. Um, there are, you know, so there's a lot of efforts going on there, but I think some of the challenge also still exists in trying to have something, um, some uniformity, some sort of standardization across the industry so that there are you know, a lot of different uh, suppliers that are feeding into um, or buying from different fishermen. And so when fishermen have to be beholden to a lot of different uh, sorts of technology in order to sort of ensure traceability through the supply chain, it makes it a little bit more burdensome than easy. So I think there's a movement towards standardization of the technology, um, adoption of the technology. Uh, but also at the legislative level, and Matt can certainly chime in as well, you know, we've, there are some efforts right now to go beyond uh, what we have now with country of origin labeling, which is, uh, Mike mentioned, really just refers to the country of processing. So you will get, you know, products that might have been caught in the U.S. but were processed overseas, and you have a product of China that actually was caught maybe in the U.S. or <laughs> elsewhere. Um, but, you know, right now we've got uh, some legislation that's been introduced, the SAFE Act, which is really looking at trying to um, not just get traceability from, you know, the boat all the way to the plate and knowing where it's coming from, but also some additional information about how it was caught, what type of gear, uh, you know, who the fishermen were. I mean, there's a lot of different information that can be embedded on some of these, uh, these traceability systems to let you know more about uh, the fishery, the gear type, the region where it was caught, um, so that consumers, retailers, restaurants, everyone can be more discerning and selective in how they're sourcing and really have that sense of um, connection to the seafood that they're purchasing. Yeah, the, the Shareholders Alliance, uh, with help from our NGO partners, a few years ago started a, a brand called Gulf Wild. And as a fisherman, 
uh, when, when I go out fishing, I, I document where we're catching our fish and we tag all of our fish and each fish has a, a individual tag with a number that can be looked up online uh, when they buy it that'll give the information about where it was caught within a grid, information about myself and a little, little history on the boat, which is really nice. I, I don't eat seafood when I go to restaurants because uh, I've, ha I've had, had bad experience, at least with fish. I've, I've gone to restaurants and asked where the red snappers come from and <clears throat> had answers like it was farm raised and, and I order a cheeseburger and they ask me why. <laughs> and I say, because if it was farm raised, I'd be out of business. I'm a commercial red snapper fisherman. So uh, I know that's not the right answer, so I'm already, I'm already done with that. So yeah, seafood with certainty, everybody wants to get what they're paying for. Um, and you know, whether it's imported or not even what it's supposed to be, you know, a, lo a lot of people I talk to say they don't like Red Snapper. They've eaten it at a restaurant and it doesn't, doesn't taste very good. And uh, after the de description they give me, I'm thinking that was probably not Red Snapper. It was, it was probably something else. So uh, yeah, the traceability and, and just the, uh, consumer confidence in what they're eating is what it's supposed to be. And also for myself, I, mean, I put my name on these fish. Uh, and quality control is at an all-time high within Gulf Wild and the conservation covenants that we have to sign on for uh, you know, fishing more sustainably, no, no high grading, no discarding fish because of market value is a, is a big part of it. It makes you feel good about being a, uh, a good steward in the fishery. I think the, the Gulf Wild, I believe, is off the uh, um, Fish Tracks platform that was developed by Oregon uh, State uh, Sea Grant. Um, and I think that, that that's a, a, neat, a, neat, a great way to uh, connect the consumer with the fisherman because it really, it decommoditizes a commodity. Because if you go to it, you scan it, a picture of the vessel comes up, the fisherman, and you, got, you, get, a, you get an identity with who's catching your product. And I think that is, um, that's a simple way. There's a cost associated with that also, obviously. But I think it's a great way to, to connect with the uh, with what's on your plate, and I think that's uh, I think we're going to see more and more of that in the future. Great. Um, I, I think a lot of this comes down to an issue that almost everybody brought up in one form or another um, in their sort of initial introductions, um, and and that's the issue of, of data collection, data management, um, and and particularly under the new requirements of the Magnuson Act, where NOAA is legally required now to set annual catch limits on 537 fish stocks, which is a massive undertaking, by the way, and, and, and first of all, congratulations to the agency for getting that done um, in, the, in, the, in the time frame that they were allocated. Um, frankly, when we, when we enacted the law or we passed the law, um, that was one that we weren't sure they'd actually be able to pull off, so Sam and, and uh, the rest of the folks, uh, Hardy, congratulations on that job well done. Um, but moving forward, particularly in a time now where we've got sequestration, we've got budget problems, um, you know, there's just not as much money in the federal system as there used to be, uh, and yet there is increasing pressure on fish stocks and increasing requirements for more science and better data. Um, how are we going to sort of riddle out that problem? Um, is there a role for industry and the private sector to play in this conversation? Um, how can fishermen be brought more into the process uh, to, to participate in the, in the data collection and management? And I think also, uh, not to load too much into one question, but we have a lot to cover, so I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, how do we balance the, 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 the really um, diverse needs of uh, recreational and commercial fisheries, the, the management of a few boats catching a lot of fish, versus a lot of boats catching a few fish at a time. Um, these are all major problems. And, and how do we find the balance in the, in the budget climate that we have? Um, wow, that's a lot. Let me back up. <laughs> let's, let's do the first part, and then we'll come back to the commercial versus recreation. <laughs> so how about that? Sorry. You can take a first step. Great. Um, I, I mean, addressing sort of the budgetary constraints issue, Increasingly, I think we're seeing a lot more stakeholders at the table when it comes to improving fisheries across the board, whether it's data collection um, or other management uh, reforms and whatnot. Uh, sort of the, I guess the the new shiny tool these days is sort of or FIPS. So for those of you guys who aren't familiar, are fishery improvement projects. And so really, what that is is getting a lot of people around the table and getting industry, particularly those. Um, those members of the supply chain that have a vested interest in a particular fishery to contribute time, to contribute resources, to contribute funding, to actually getting, uh, moving that fishery along a trajectory towards greater sustainability. So, you know, the traditional paradigm was either 
buy it or don't buy it. But increasingly, there's investments in how to fix it. And data collection is a real, a real issue globally, not just in the United States, in terms of we have so many data deficient fisheries. So how do you manage when you don't know what it is that you're dealing with? Um, so in the FIP context, you know, even those folks who are involved in FIPS, who are engaged in FIPS, who want to see um, a fishery improve, are sort of hamstrung because oftentimes you see this maybe a 20-year time frame for a stock to be rebuilt for all the improvements that are needed to actually get uh, instituted. And so I think it can have a chilling effect on those who actually want to engage, want to like see this fishery improve, um, and don't want to necessarily have a 20-year time or money investment. <coughs> So one of the things that you know we've been developing along with, I know Tony Chatwin's here from National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, um, Darden Restaurants, who's one of our corporate partners, uh, and Walton Family Foundation, has been to look at the development of a fishery improvement project fund. So basically combining um, federal money with, uh, or uh, government funds along with foundation funds and industry funds to sort of leverage that and really put it towards these fishery improvement projects. Um, so that's sort of something that's just evolving now. And um, for those folks who are interested in more details, um, it's, it's really an opportunity to start um, complementing and supplementing sort of the limited government funding that's out there right now to um, derive improvements, to improve data collection, all these different things that are needed in fisheries. I'm going to jump in on the first half of Mike's question in the hope of uh, dodging the second part, which sounds pretty uh, pretty fraud to me. Um, look, uh, the thing I wanted to say um, was that obviously, you know, in terms of the ACLs and AMs on over 500 stocks, that was a difficult thing to do, but we didn't shy away from it and we got it done. That was the right thing to do. And on, on the management questions in terms of a mix of data sets, you know, once again, it's difficult, but we need to stick at it. Um, and there, there are legislative proposals to say, if we don't have an extremely rich data source in the fisheries, let, let's just not manage them, essentially. Let's shy away from science-based annual catch limits. Um, and we think that's fundamentally the wrong approach to take. And, you know, in terms of next generation thinking, there are some really innovative um, approaches to management of data-limited stocks. Um, you don't have to have a, you know, annual benchmark assessment to be able to manage a fishery. Um, and, you know, a lot of work's been done in this area. NRDC, I think, just a month or two ago, released um, a good synopsis of some of the approaches to data-limited management. This can be done, and, um, you know, fisheries management is hard inherently because we can't just sit, sit down and count all the fish, but um, there's ways that we can do this. And to pick up on a point you made, Mike, um, Fishermen really are a critical part of this. Um, cooperative research is a critical part of it, ensuring that, um, you know, catch, that what fishermen are seeing on the water and catch is being incorporated into management is critical. Um, I think that, you know, as anybody who does any kind of um, fisheries management modeling knows, uh, the quality of your model is dependent upon the quality of the data. And in many respects, um, saying this as a fisheries biologist, especially in the recreational world, we have not uh, done a fantastic job of educating the fishermen about what type of data are needed and how the data are being used. Um, typically, um, they'll see a, an assessment um, come out and then regulations, but there hasn't been any communication in the meantime about what it all means and, and why it happens. So I think as part of this process, we need to make uh, some very real efforts to get the, uh, the information out there about what data are needed and why they're needed and how they're being used so that the users of the resources are also participating not only in the data acquisition but in how that data is interpreted. Because it's very easy to see a lot of numbers and apply an appropriate model, but without the, um, let's say, on the water knowledge, uh, you might reach conclusion A when in fact it's B um, because of that type of local knowledge. And if you can't interact with the users of the resource in your interpretation of the data, um, then you set your up, yourself up for some errors that might not affect the management of the fishery, the success of the management, but it would, will affect the interaction with the user groups and make things more difficult in the future. So I think we have to, to some extent, take a step back and, 
and Bubba can talk to this as well, and uh, somewhat look at the perspective of the user groups. Uh, you remember that the people who are out there on the water are not only the primary users of the resource, but they're the primary beneficiaries. And so they have the most vested interest to uh, make sure that the resource sticks around. And not in all cases, of course, but in many cases, it's a lack of understanding of how the process works. So the more that we can make it a, a cooperative process, um, I think the better it'll, it'll work. And that's not easy. It involves a lot of face time. And the, the high-tech tools are fantastic for data acquisition, but we have to do the face time and the education first to make sure that they work. Yeah, I, I would say, you know, everybody wants, wants better data, better science, and who better to work with than the stakeholders. Uh, I am a stakeholder in a commercial fishery, and I would like to see it get better. Uh, I would have no problem working with uh, management to uh, get some better type of data collection and, and make these, science, uh, these scientific models based on real-time data of, of what's going on on the water uh, in, in the commercial industry. Within the Alliance, we'd like to see uh, uh, you know, data collection with cameras on a boat for a zero discard fishery. There's no reason why on, on my commercial boat I should be discarding any fish at all. We can, uh, we were part of a pilot program that had cameras on a boat that recorded discards and um, it, it worked out, you know, it, it was just a pilot. We were, there was a few problems, but I think that uh, the next generation of fishermen commercially should, should be in a zero discard fishery. There's uh, a lot of data to be collected that way and that data can be shared. Um, and, I, and I think that uh, the recreational is a, uh, you know, I, I do have a charter boat, and I do recreational, f you know, recreationally fish. Uh, the only hope for good data collection there would be the stakeholders and the recreational fishermen, which are the charter boat guys. And there's uh, lots of different ways now with technology for those guys to uh, get good data to the management and to the scientists that would, I think, help them in their stock assessments. Um, in, in that direction, I, I just, and this is um, a question that, that came in part from the audience, it's, it, and I think it's, it's relevant to the conversation um, as, it, as it's progressing here. Um, the, one of the things that, that I understand can be somewhat difficult, and I'd love to get the, uh, the industry folks' perspective on this from both recreational and commercial, um, as, as the, the question, I'll just read the question because then I don't have to paraphrase it. Um, the, the, the next generation of fishermen in the U.S. are, are entrepreneurs. And successfully changing their business models to adapt to sustainability. So, is the country investing enough in the changes that are needed? For example, uh, where do fishermen turn to support their new approaches? Uh, as as they and, and now I'll paraphrase a little bit. As they develop their um, these new technologies and new methods uh, and new gear types and things like that, is there a sufficient response from the agency, from the federal government, about incorporating them into the management structure and into the fishery? Um, I guess I'll start with that. Uh, from a recreation perspective, I'd say. Uh, uh, no, that management uh, data collection are behind. Uh, for example, um, we do a lot of the work that Bonefish Tarpon Trust does is with uh, uh, fisheries that are um, almost entirely catch and release. Um, and there's really no mechanism in the management world to address catch and release species. Um, the assumption's always been, oh, they're catch and release, um, the fishery's fine, populations are fine. But uh, as we're learning, um, that's not the case. Uh, some species are appropriate for catch and release fisheries. Their post release mortality is extremely low. Uh, other species, uh, their post release mortality is, is way too high to be sustainable. And so it should be managed uh, more like a, a, a harvest fishery. Um, even fisheries that are managed uh, recreationally for, um, that can be kept harvested, uh, snook, for example, in, uh, in Florida, uh, because of changing ethics of angling and uh, management um, requirements uh, to make sure the fishery is sustainable. 98% uh, of that fishery is catch and release, yet there's no mechanisms in place to measure how many fish are released and their survival. Um, in addition, you know, there's not a whole lot of spatial data on fishing effort and catch. Um, and that's, all, again, associated with habitat. So one of the things that we've been working on with recreational fishing guides in the Florida Keys is to map their fishing areas, uh, overlay those with uh, habitat maps, and then work with a National Marine Sanctuary um, to create uh, new types of uh, zone management. Catch and release zones, for example, are appropriate for some of the species. Um, or habitat protection zones that allow certain types of fishing, those types of things. Um, but those are all things that we're, we're trying as we go. So as a whole, no, we're not, we're not there. 
from you as a perspective on, on sort of incorporating new uh, technologies? Uh, well, I think um, dealing with the um, technology, I think the, 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 the catch program we have on the West Coast, we're looking at electronic monitoring to lower observer cost, uh, because obviously if cost goes up, uh, efforts are going to go down because uh, uh, people aren't making enough money to, uh, to be profitable. Um, so I think certainly uh, that aspect as far as uh, catch accounting is uh, important. Um, uh, we have money to, uh, for the council the next couple of years to work towards that. I think the good part is that we could uh, parlay that across the country. It's not uh, just a one-off uh, project. Um, uh, like for the most part, we do have a good catch accounting uh, on the West Coast. We only uh, uh, we had observers uh, partial coverage for the last uh, 10 years. Uh, we have 100% accountability right now, 100% observer coverage in the trawl fishery right now. Uh, but I think a lot of fisheries can benefit from that uh, because certainly the removals are as almost important as what the um, accurate stock assessments. Well, one of the challenges um, in applying um, the commercial fisheries model is um, there's limited ports of sale, of entry for commercial, commercially caught products. <coughs> but we talked about the fish houses and they can be audited, et cetera. Um, for the recreational fishery, um, even the intercept uh, surveys that are done at boat ramps uh, are not in, in any way adequate. And we, we know that, we're just not sure how to access it. Um, in, in Florida, for example, um, people launch at boat ramps, they launch out of their backyards, they pull off the road uh, and launch you know, right off the dirt between the mangroves, those types of things. And they're not uh, getting um, surveyed at all. Um, there are some applications, uh, phone, smartphone applications out there um, that are being worked on as ways to uh, access more data. Um, but even with that information, we're not quite sure yet how to use it. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, because you can get the good news reports. You only hear about the trips where they catch fish, not where they don't. <laughs> and in many ways, it's, it's, um, it is important to know, the pop, get population estimates out of that data, but it's also important to be able to figure out just the trends. Is, is the catch rate trending up or down, staying steady. Um, because in a lot of these fisheries, we're never going to get the traditional bodies on the dock that you, are used for traditional fisheries management. Um, so we've got to come up with innovative ways. And the funding limitation is, is hindering a lot of that experimentation. So I think it's up to the industry itself and some of the NGOs to um, put some serious money into figuring that out and providing that, um, that type of information or those uh, data acquisition uh, methods to National Marine Fisheries Service in the states. Well, it's, yeah, it's an interesting point, and, and it gets to another question that, I, that I've got in my pile here, which is the question um, which I sort of flagged because I think it's an interesting one. It's, it's a little bit um, provocative, but I mean, budget constraints are becoming a major impediment to effective management, and by definition, commercial fishery is the take of a, of a public trust resource for profit. Uh, isn't it time to have a small portion of this profit to pay its management costs? Well, right, right now, the commercial fishery under the catch shares for the reef fish in the Gulf, I pay 3% of everything I make to a cost recovery to help, help manage the fishery. Um, I'm not sure if that's, of course, that's not going to take care of all of it, but 3% is a, a big deal to me, and especially uh, some of the guys that are a leasing, leasing quota that are on a small profit margin. I, I will say National Marine Fisheries, uh, you know, when, when we have ideas or, or thoughts that, that we think could improve data collection, they are willing to listen. Now, implementing it's another thing. I think that they would like to see that be more industry driven, and that's where the Shareholders Alliance comes in to talk to them about, you know, that this is, this is what we think we should do to help with uh, um, discards or, or keeping better track of discards and what we're catching. Um, because, I, like I said, I, I don't want to discard any fish. I'd like to keep them all. And when, when, you, when you have a uh, zero discard, it, it tends to change the way you uh, the way you fish, you're going to fish more sustainably because you want to capitalize on your on what you're catching in, in the best way that you can for your business. It makes you run a better business model. And unfortunately, you know, uh, I'm 43 years old and I consider myself one of the younger. Uh, I think Matt said the, the next generation is already here. Unfortunately, <laughs> um, you know, my son's nine years old. Back there in the derby, <clears throat> before we had catchers, I would never, I would never, never encourage him to get into commercial fishing at all. And a lot of the, my, my uh, uh, friends in the, in the commercial fishing industry are, are, are like my father's age. Their kids have already grown up and doing something else. So it really, really bothers me that, that the next generation of commercial fishermen uh, 
you know, kids are going to, I have to go out and find them, you know, and talk. My son's friends all want to commercial fish, and luckily it's, it's in the news, it's on, it's on TV with all these reality shows. It's, it's kind of getting a, a boost right now. Everyone wants to be a commercial fisherman. Of course, they all want to go and catch bluefin tuna, yeah. not red snapper. <laughs> um, but, but luckily for the next generation, that, that, that uh, media is, is really helping a lot. Yeah. And, and uh, with catch shares it being something that I can pass down to, to my son and, you know, yeah. and then have him stay interested in it as a, as a good way to make a living. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, as, as Matt and I, we happened to run into each other walking into the building this morning, and we were looking at the, the headlines that they put outside mm -hmm. down the street. There were four different fishery stories on the front pages of the newspapers that yeah. they put up outside the museum today, and I don't think they did that because we're here. I don't I think they're wondering. quite, I mean, no offense <laughs> to anybody here who works for the museum, but I don't think they're quite that sophisticated. It just, it is becoming much more of a story right now than, than I think it has been in the past, and, and that kind of media attention can't hurt. Um, um, I think that uh, Bubba mentioned the 3% cost recovery. Um, that, that's, off the, that's off the top, that, right. that's, the, that's right. off the net. Yeah. And I think that um, you gotta be very careful about going down that path, but much beyond that, in the sense that um, you want to encourage people to land fish, because land and fish creates jobs throughout the entire the entire chain. The whole, I mean, it's the processor, the packaging, the boxes. I mean, uh, we're we're seeing that on the West Coast to a certain extent. We're trying to get with the catch air program. We're trying to peel back the layers of the old management system, which are still under. We still have 100 um, percent. Uh, we're 100 percent accountable. Um, and so we're only landing 30 percent of the quota right now. And the benefit to landing maybe 50 or 60 percent is tremendous because uh, there's a lot of jobs being uh, created, uh, taxes being paid, and uh, which flow into the government. So I think people ought to be uh, careful about uh, how, they how they look at that. Two, two quick points on budget. Um, first of all, even in this um, difficult budget climate, we have actually managed to continue to increase the expanding annual stock assessments line item. I think the agency's done mm -hmm. a great job of prioritising that. Advocates, including the fishing industry, have stressed how critical that is. The second point I'd make is that this is an investment that pays an enormous return. Um, you know, our nation invests in terrestrial infrastructure, roads and bridges to facilitate the economy. And the fisheries information infrastructure is similarly an investment that our nation needs to make in this billion dollar industry. Um, and you know, the, the return on this investment, I will, you know, I will go up to the hill and argue, argue for any time. And um, you know, I think we'd get an enormous return. I, I would point out that uh, industry already is putting money into extra research. Um, last year, the uh, they put up like four hundred thousand dollars to uh, do the uh, combine the sardine uh, hake survey, which uh, we've got a, a much more information, uh, better informed uh, managers. So I, you're going to see more and more of that in the future, especially in a catcher program where people have a vested interest in what the, what the fishery. They really, I mean, they, that's, that's a huge investment uh, for their future, and so they're going to be involved in that more and more uh, in the future. Yeah, the research set aside has been very successful in the in the New England scallop fishery as well, um, and I, I think you can see that more as as fisheries become profitable. Uh, there's more capital available to to put back in. I think it's a difficult thing to say to a, a fishery like, say, the New England ground fishery that is in a a, a, a lengthy, let's just say, uh, state of rebuilding. Uh, you know, you guys who just got your quota cut by 77%, oh, by the way, we're also going to be um, grabbing 3% off the top from you. So um, it's it's a tough sell uh, as fisheries are rebuilding. But I think it's an interesting question as we look towards, um, you know, what what we're going to do in this in the budget climate that we're in, where that additional funding is going to come from. But But how do you measure the value? I mean, you can't just measure the value as a certain number of dollars per pound of fish right. because the effort... Um, their expenditures have you know, magnification effects. Um, and so, for example, that uh, direct expenditures uh, for a recreational fishery might be $120 million, but with multiplier effects, it gets up to $400 million. So how do you actually value that? You know, how do people at the restaurants that uh, serve red snap, certified red snapper, their jobs depend on that also? Um, so I think Matt's point is, is it's an investment, and you can't really um, cordon it off that way because the repercussions or the ripples just go throughout the entire, uh, not just the nation, but the region. Uh, well, we've got, let's see, where are we here? We've got about half an hour left. Um, good. So that, because we still have a lot of ground to cover. Um, and the questions, I got to say, you're, you're, the questions from the audience have been outstanding. So um, I, I apologize. I'm, I can guarantee you I'm not going to get to all of them, but um, uh, they are, they've been really great. Um, 
one thing that I that I have wanted to address the the management structure in um, commercial fisheries in particular, but fisheries in general is uh, is different than pretty much any other, um, particularly natural resource um, um, industry that we have in this country. Uh, it's set up with the fishery management council structure where industry members actually sit on the boards that, that develop the, the regulations. Um, so I, I have sort of an open-ended question, which is just, how's it working? Um, is the council structure functioning as it should? Is there adequate representation of different interests? Is, are, are shifting balances causing problems on councils? Um, you know, how, what do you think about the, the council structure in general? Uh, our, our council, you know, Structure's not not doing too well right now. It's not a. Uh, it's definitely not balanced. We we used to have uh, seats that were appointed for recreational or commercial interests, and it seems like lately the uh, shift has been more toward recreational, and, and not at a good time right now. We're in a uh, battle for reallocation uh, for the recreational sector. Wants more fish and more days uh, fishing, and they feel like the best way to do that is to grab fish from the commercial sector. Um, right now, the recreational sector is overfishing their uh, catch limits, and it doesn't really make sense to take fish out of an accountable system and put it into an, an unaccountable system um, until they can get their management straightened out and stop overfishing. I, I don't really think that that's the uh, solution to the problem, but a lot of the council members do, and a lot of the council members are uh, more on the recreational side of uh, fisheries management. So that's that's a problem right now that I, I'm hoping will be addressed. We have very few real commercial representatives on our council right now, and they're they're fading fast. So it's is up to this, it's the, up to organizations like that. That's why I joined the alliance to make sure that we go to the council meetings that uh, our members can be uh, heard for for what they want to say and represented. Yeah, yeah. Brett. Uh, I, I, on the Pacific uh, Council, I think that um, a lot of the issues of the recreational commercial. Uh, um, Fighting, I guess that we see around the country, uh, we're really kind of. Uh, I don't say we're beyond that, but uh, we really don't have the. Uh, we're not really fighting over the same fish for the most part. It's uh, uh, like the trawling industry, which is the biggest uh, biggest fishery on the, uh, the West Coast. Uh, with, um, um, for the most part, we're offshore, not competing for those stocks. And the ones we are, we we kind of uh, got a pretty good line out as far as how the allocations have been. So for the most part, we get along fairly well um, amongst the, those user groups. Um, I think that um, uh, we wish we would have had a trawler on the council during the, uh, the trawl individual quota uh, formation of the, of the catcher program for the groundfish. Um, but even given that, it went pretty well, and uh, for the most part, we're, uh, we have a good working relationship across sectors and across states, and I think it's, uh, we're pretty fortunate to be there mm -hmm. after I've heard some of the stories. So. And I think with uh, with the council system, it's a bit like Churchill's quote on democracy, it's the worst system except for all the others that have been tried from time to time. I mean, you know, you imagine the kind of um, trust issues that would emerge if, you know, these decisions were issued by edict from Silver Spring. I mean, the council process really is a triumph of federalism, I think. Um, and, you know, it, it needs to be preserved. There are also real problems in some of the individual applications of how it's working at the moment, I think. Um, uh, you know, there was mention of the Gulf Council. We saw the chair of that council um, nominated and then the nomination withdrawn under political pressure by the governor of Florida last year. Um, that was scandalous. And it's um, the kind of thing which, you know, can operate within the council system that we have. And it, it requires us to be vigilant in policing that, shining a light on it, and making sure that this fantastic federalist system um, works the way it's intended. I was just going to say, you know, I, I very much agree with Matt's comments, and um, you know, I think there's uh, the council, the system that's set up right now has it provides a lot of opportunity for different stakeholders to come to the table to discuss things, to make recommendations. I mean, having seen you know fishery management systems in other countries and um, how they function and sort of the oftentimes the lack of even a venue to come together for different stakeholders to talk and to share their ideas and to vent their frustrations um, is uh, is problematic you know uh, so I think you know from from that perspective the council system is, is, is a great um, 
system. There's certainly some issues in individual councils. I think the, rep the lack of representation of sort of the public interest in the conservation community broadly across you know, the country and all the different councils is something that needs to be addressed. Um, I think there's some concern too regarding the accountability. A lot of the decisions that come out of the council, you know, obviously the final um, say rests with uh, the agency and not with the council. And so it's sort of a low risk proposition for sometimes for councils to make recommendations that aren't necessarily um, the ones that they should be making, I guess. Uh, but, you know, overall, I think, you know, having sort of a more democratic system where you have more stakeholders involved breeds more ownership and stewardship in sort of what's going on with the resource, too. So. I'd like to point out the, the West Coast, I think that, um, well, I, I think the council is basically the most open and transparent system I've ever seen. I, virtually anybody can come to the council, and if you have a good idea or you see an issue, and they can address it, they do. And I think that um, they're very responsive, and I think it's uh, a, really a model. Well, that, that's good to hear. Uh, one of the things that, that Matt brought up that kind of flagged my attention, and it's not one that I actually had um, had written down, but I think given the fact that we're here at Capitol Hill Oceans Week, it's appropriate to address the role of, of politics in, in fishery management. Um, I think, uh, frankly, I'm surprised I didn't think of it sooner. But um, the, uh, <laughs> but I mean, in New England, we've seen uh, uh, members uh, who are, um, considered great supporters of environmental causes uh, go against a lot of those organizations that they that they typically align with uh, in the interest of, of their fishing constituents. Um, we see similar situations occurring, obviously, in the Gulf. So I, I'd love to get some perspective on, on, on that uh, particular issue. Uh, and, and I guess I, because I'm just formulating this now, I don't really have a specific question thought out. But, but I think it's, 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 it's fascinating the, the amount of uh, influence that that fishing constituents have over some of their elected uh, representatives, and is that a good thing? Is it um, an inappropriate amount of, of influence? Is it you know wh what are folks' thoughts on the on the political aspects of this? Well, regional management council should be done at, at that level, not not passed down from from DC. And when we come to DC to to talk to our uh, congressman or whatnot. Uh, that's, that's the main thing we ask for them, just to let the council process work. I think the council process and the Gulf Council, I, I think it's a great process. I would just like to see it a little more uh, more balanced and fair in the representation. That's it. The, the process is great as long as uh, the, the, the members on the council let that process unfold. Uh, a lot of times they, they just don't, don't seem to be able to get anything going. You know? and, and the final say-so is with the... Uh, Administration, so like like Matt was saying, I mean, you know, it's just it's just a matter of them uh, coming coming together and, and finding the best solutions for for the industry and, and letting that play out. Uh, it seems simple, but it doesn't always you know, work that way. I guess I'd just say there's a obviously a place for politics in fisheries as in all things. Um, the key thing that we have achieved in which has facilitated success in US fisheries is to get the politics out of the part that should be occupied by scientists. Um, and you know, it's not appropriate for politicians to be saying this is how many red snapper should be pulled out of the Gulf of Mexico this year. There are some folks on Capitol Hill, um, I'm happy to name names, who think they should be doing that. Um, go, go ahead. There are, uh, <laughs> Steve Sutherland. Um, there are, there are uh, of course, um, you know, the, the SSCs, the, the scientific and statistical committees, have that role. Um, and it is critical and a key piece for us um, as advocates to make sure that, that that role is maintained as an independent scientific assessment of the fishery. Good perspective. Um, so I want to take another uh, question from the audience. Um, this one's about uh, a topic that I meant to bring up, and it, it was, um, it, it's it sort of just put well, um, just that, that uh, as, as increasingly uh, around the world, we're seeing um, uh, aquaculture play a larger role in, uh, in the seafood industry. Um, and and th so the question here is, um, you know, can we accelerate integration of aquaculture and fishing in coastal communities to use the full range of technologies to produce seafood domestically? So um, basically, is, th is there a way to balance uh, ongoing commercial harvest 
uh, in, of wild fisheries with an, an increase in aquaculture? Can they go hand in hand? Should we be promoting aquaculture more in this country than we already are? Well, certainly, um, the, probably the, 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 the range of quality of aquaculture from around the country is, um, is probably pretty vast as far as the, the, the range. So um, obviously, we're eating a, a large amount of aquaculture fish in this country right now. Um, it's probably not a, as a commercial fishing representative, I mean, uh, I, I mean, people eat it, we gotta accept that, and probably it'd be better to have it uh, come out of our, through our country than somebody else's, at least as far as for health and safety uh, issues. Um, I know a lot of people in the salmon industry complain about, uh, you know, farm salmon, uh, but I think farm salmon has probably created a lot more salmon eaters in the world than wild harvest ever would have. Uh, so I think you gotta look at the two different ways in the sense that um, a wild fish is steak, and maybe uh, farm fish is hamburger, as far as I'm looking at it, as far as the quality. So it just, um, it's, it's a source of protein, and we want to feed people, that's what we do. I think that's the basis of fisheries. It, it, people lose the context is that uh, we feed people, right? So I don't, never want to forget that. I think one of the things to consider or keep in mind is the uh, uh, outside of, of the fishing uh, industry, commercial or recreational, is the ecosystem uh, effects of aquaculture. Mm -hmm. Um, not all aquaculture is created equal. Um, one of the issues, uh, challenges I should say, that does affect the recreational fishery is the harvest of forage fish to basically create meal to feed farm fish. And the conversion ratio right now on feed to, to product is very poor. Um, and I know a number of folks in the aquaculture industry are working on other sources of protein to feed the fish, um, which I think is going to be necessary to be able to have aquaculture to feed people at the scale that's going to be needed in the relatively near future. Um, another issue that has kind of raised its, its head for coastal fisheries is the effluent that comes from some of the mm -hmm. aquaculture. Um, and that, that again can be addressed. Um, uh, unfortunately, one of the problems is that the, the profit margin uh, isn't huge. And so it's hard for the industry to invest in things like uh, to be quite frank, a, a large shrimp aquaculture farm that's on the coast probably needs a sewage treatment plant because they create that much uh, effluent. Um, but it's hard to justify that financially. So I think we're kind of at that place where we know that changes are needed um, and on a pretty big scale. Uh, and how do we actually do that to provide food for people but then also to uh, be able to sustain our coastal ecosystems? Um. I think that's, uh, you know, ultimately what we talk about when we talk about fisheries, uh, commercial fisheries anyway, is, is food source. And I think that's, that's really um, the bottom line in all of this. And so, you know, as, as we look at aquaculture emerging in, in the global market with half of that fish that we import effectively being farm product, it's, it's something that, that we've got to take a look at. And, and I, I'm going to um, bring in a, a couple other sort of audience perspective questions here on another topic that I wanted to bring up that kind of relates to this, is, which is, um, and, and the whole next generation issue, which is the issue of climate change uh, and how climate uh, um, change is, is affecting um, fish stocks and, and ultimately how it's going to be able to affect um, fisheries management. Um, I think, you know, just looking at the question here, I'll just, I'll just read it. We can kind of use it as a kickoff. I mean, how will the next generation of fishing be affected by climate change and other associated stressors like ocean acidification? And how will they begin to address these, these um, potential impacts? And, and how should the agency be, and, and Congress, I guess, to the extent that, that they, um, first of all, are willing to say the words climate change, but second of all, are, are willing to address it in a, in a Magnuson reauthorization? Uh, how, how, should, how should it be incorporated into future fishery management? Well, um, uh, the acting NOAA administrator yesterday talked about environmental intelligence. Um, and if you are a skeptic on climate change, talk to a fisherman, talk to a lobsterman in Maine who has seen uh, the changes just in the last 10, 20 years, talk to a uh, crabber in the Bering Sea who is concerned about whether or not they'll have a fishery uh, for their kids because of the capacity of crabs to build shells in more acidic seas. Um, so, you know, I, I think there are so many things pointing us towards the urgency of addressing climate change on this planet right now. Fisheries is one. Um, so I think, you know, fishermen are very compelling messengers on this and we need to empower them. We need to put them on 
um, you know, on congressional committees and on podiums to talk about what they're seeing on the water. Um, the specific management question, I think, is a critical one. Um, if we're managing a stock that is migrating north because of uh, changing ocean temperatures, um, there are real challenges in doing that within the existing Ma Magnuson framework. There's a lot of people in the room who are more expert on this than me, but it clearly needs to be part of the equation. And as those uh, uh, stocks um, change their geographic ranges, um, our assessment of how they use the different habitats um, is going to change as well. Um, you know, for example, you might uh, think about a particular coastline uh, estuaries being important for a juvenile life stage of an economically important fish. Um, that geographic range of estuaries is going to change, um, perhaps fit, uh, shift north. Um, and if we don't have that type of foresight to see the uh, overall quality of those habitats for that species but others as well, um, then we're going to basically, once you lose the habitats, you're, you can't go back. So it's having a, a broader perspective. And I know politically that's uh, tough to do. Um, but going back to Matt's point about the fishermen, um, a recent survey of recreational um, fishermen and hunters as well uh, if I remember the numbers correctly, more than 75% put climate change effects on their uh, way of life as the top issue. Um, so the, con the constituents of the politicians get it. Um, and it's translating that to a higher level, I think that's the challenge. Go ahead, Frank. On the West Coast, we've um, actually kind of entered a cold water period, which is kind of contrary to what you see on the, on the uh, Atlantic Coast. Um, I think when it comes to what's going on in the ocean, you need to kind of um, uh, get a feel for how that uh, fits into the productivity of the fish stocks. Um, for instance, on the, for the, the Oregon pink shrimp fishery, which is a state-managed fishery, we were at, uh, last year we had the second best landings on record with a third of the vessels that participated in the record year uh, 30 years ago. Um, catch per unit efforts are double. The record is, um, they're double what the old record used to be for the catch per unit effort. So I mean that uh, while change is happening, it's not necessarily bad for everything. Some stocks do better in some, in some uh, environments than others. Um, crab in the West Coast has been, uh, we've had record catches the last, uh, the last 10 years. So I mean, there's a lot, of, a lot of stuff happening. I think it's not all bad news, but I think we need to, with that, we need to acknowledge um, uh, what the productivity of the ocean is in those different regions are to specific stocks and uh, manage for that. Given the, uh, the need for fishing businesses, fishermen and, and uh, industries to have some sort of certainty and, and hopefully some long-term stability in, in what they produce in order to, to maintain the markets that they create and some of these issues. Um, how, how is that affecting, uh, how, how, w how will that affect effectively the business of fishing if, if, you know, if it becomes more cyclical, if there are you know, changes that, that, that drive um, fish to different regions? Is that a, I mean, how does that affect the industry? Uh, I'm not industry, but I will try to <laughs> answer a little bit of that. I mean, I think this gets back to my earlier comment about sort of the need to sort of diversify our palate and the products that are going to market and create markets for those products out there that, you know, might not currently be recognized as, um, you know, something that consumers want to eat or what we'll buy. Um, but, you know, to have, have a consumer economy out there that is willing to embrace new things, to try new products, because if, you, you know, if you're having a shifting regime where you basically are encountering different species compositions in your catch, um, you know, and you don't necessarily have the flexibility to move north to follow the stocks, um, you know, you're going to need to have a, a willing market there to receive sort of the composition that you are catching, basically. At the same time, I mean, I think there's there's challenges inherent in that approach as well. I mean, management obviously has to be able to keep pace with this. You can't just species hop, you know, and sort of without knowing exactly, you know, what's going on and having sort of more of an, as we've been talking about, an ecosystem-based approach and how those particular species, um, what their status is, how they fit into the, what's their role in the ecosystem. So, you know, it sort of has to be two part, we really have to sort of be able to have the resources to step up management to have a more holistic view of what's going on out there. But at the same time, the incentives need to be aligned on the market side such that we're not just demanding what we can no longer get, you know. I mean, 
for the most part, anything comes out of the ocean is pretty, it's, it's pretty good. I mean, there's not many things that are undesirable to eat. So I think it's, it's uh, I, I certainly agree and I appreciate the, what you're saying there. And there's a lot of, um, there's a, uh, most everything that comes out of the ocean is, is pretty tasty and it's pretty good for you. Yeah. Yeah, and with climate change, I, I mean, you know, commercial, <laughs> commercial fishermen are, are very, very adaptable. And with climate change, I think that, that a lot of commercial fishermen will, will see the need to, to adapt to that climate change and hopefully we'll re relay that to, at, at the council levels what they're seeing and what the changes are when they're happening. I know some of them are gradual, but like you said, you don't, you don't want to wait till it's too late, especially when it, com especially when it comes to habitat uh, because you, it's a lot harder to uh, bring, that, bring something like that back after it's already been you know, destroyed. So yeah, I, I think the, you know, the next generation will have to adapt <coughs> to climate change and I, and I think they will learn along the way that um, you know that, that's just something they're going to have to deal with, and, and stay in touch with with their management and their councils to let them know what's going on. Um, well, we've got uh, just a few minutes left. We're sort of coming down to it, um, so I, I want to sort of bring this back around to this next generation concept that we've that we've been talking about quite a bit. Um, there was some conversation, I think, very early on about the issue of um, new entrants to the fishery. Uh, you know, Buddy certainly talked about it. Um, others as well and how when you have an established um, fishery uh, new folks can 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 be become a part of that fishery moving forward um, and also to, to incorporate a, another audience question here um, you know w will the next generation of, of fisheries uh, of fishers fishermen be able to survive in one fishery or will individuals need to uh, have diverse operations to survive? And is that something that our management system is capable of? Uh, as we get into an increasing move toward um, sort of compartmentalizing, whether it's catch shares or, or other management systems, um, is that diversity going to be there? You know, Buddy obviously is uh, working commercially as well as recreationally. That's one kind of, of diversity, the charter sector. Um, but also multiple fisheries. Um, will folks be able to maintain permits? Should management make that easier to ensure a, a, a more diverse future, for, uh, particularly in light of changes that may be coming down the pike? Well, well, on the West Coast, uh, most people, uh, most fishermen, uh, do fish in multiple fisheries, uh, whether, whether it be you know, the Dungeness crab or salmon or albacore tuna, the ground fish fishery at uh, di the different sectors, uh, fixed gear, trawl. Um, so I mean, most most people, uh, any as any um, businessman or even a person who has managing their investment, have a portfolio of uh, you don't have the, your stuff all in one stock per se, and that that moves uh, beyond uh, stocks and bonds, but also fish fish stocks. I think that uh, most people, or most successful people, have a diverse um, uh, group of fisheries they participate in. I, I mean, I think the, it's a good question, and um, it speaks to the need for managers, I think, and for councils in particular, to think about the broader goals they're looking to advance in the context of their management decisions. A couple of the councils have gone through visioning processes which I think have been really useful efforts to say what kind of communities do we want, um, what kind of fisheries do we want you know, 25 years from now, and how do we manage to achieve that goal? Um, you know, there, in, in rights-based management fisheries, I think in particular, there's been an evolution to say, how do we make decisions about quota? How do we establish rules for new entrants to those limited access fisheries? which actually advance the goals we're looking to achieve. And too often I think maybe we don't actually make explicit those goals and then we're upset when management decisions don't go where we might implicitly want them to go. Um, but where we can say, you know, we want to guard against consolidation and ensure that small operators have a place in this fishery, then you can look at management decisions that advance that goal, whether it be uh, caps on quota for individual operators, or whether it be something like the fisheries funds that have been established in some communities which allow um, new entrants to buy in at subsidised rates and then get on their feet and then buy their own quota. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of good stuff happening in this space and which is why ultimately in a, you know, the environmental community is often a place of doom and gloom. I think there's so much to be, although there's real challenges, there's a lot to be optimistic about in, in fisheries for the next generation. I think the key is going to be um a, a true, truly adaptive management, or even more so proactive management, to avoid things like serial overfishing. Um, because there's different ways to diversify. One is to uh, 
um, say, seasonally fish for different species, which already occurs. Um, another is to change what your target is when your um, return rate, your catch rate on your, your targeted species declines to such an extent that you move effort elsewhere, um, which is obviously very dangerous. And I think uh, from the um, conservation side of things, uh, we can help with management by keeping our fingers on the pulse of some of those changes in the fishery that the data is going to be behind. You know, the data collection is always behind. Um, so I think as a conservation community, we can be proactive too um, because a lot of us work directly with the fishing, whether it's recreational, commercial, different sectors. And then we also have uh, good uh, relationships with the management agencies. And trying to fill that disconnect, I think, will, will help because um, things are changing. I see that in recreational fishery already um, on a pretty uh, rapid <laughs> pace. Uh, so being able to help, for example, I work a lot with the state of Florida to try and um, help them maneuver where things are going next year, two years from now, not reacting to what happened two years ago. And I think on the commercial scale, that's an even bigger challenge. Yeah, new entrance is, is a big challenge. The alliance is working right now with, with, uh, with within our organization to provide some kind of relief, uh, some kind of set aside for future entrance. And, uh, you know, this this... Red snapper fishery has been under consolidation uh, since I started because we had not enough fish and too many fishermen. So <clears throat> the natural thing to do is con to consolidate. But now with catch shares and having a more flexible management, um, it looks like now we're, we're seeing more people want to. You know your management's working when before no one wanted to get into it, and now everybody wants to get into <laughs> it. So uh, we, uh, we, need to, uh, we, need, we need to address that issue, and it's going to be... Uh, with the cooperation of our uh, council and National Marine Fisheries to get to get these new entrants in, because there is room now. Yeah, well, that's great, and and I think you know we're we're about out of time, unfortunately. I think I think that's a pretty good place to wrap up because it's actually a sort of optimistic note. You know, more people are actually trying to, to get back into this fishery, which must mean it's actually doing pretty well. Uh, and I think that's you know it's a, a <laughs> tribute to a lot of the work that that a lot of the folks in this room have done uh, at the agency and elsewhere. Um, so thank you for your efforts on that. Um, and thanks certainly to the panelists for being here and sharing their time. There um, were, is a, I still have a laundry list of topics. I have a huge stack of questions that we didn't get to, so I apologize for that. Um, but, uh, you know, 90 minutes is, is 90 minutes, and I think the conversation was a pretty good overview and, and uh, appreciate everybody's contributions. And, and thanks to um, Jason and, and Jeb and the foundation for putting it together. Thanks very much. Hey, thank you, Mike, and thank you to all of the panelists. This was a phenomenal discussion that tackled a lot of um, very important issues. Thank you also for keeping the questions coming. Make sure that you keep aware of the volunteers as they walk the aisles over the panels over the next few days. And um, again, thank you for the discussion. We'll take a half-hour break. We'll be back at, uh, at 11 o'clock. Thanks. <laughs>